and we face we really face dangers from uh, a huge section of the world who think that America and Americans are war mongers, that the national psyche of America is as a war mongering country, that we I mean, we think we're peaceful people, don't we? I mean, most most of us we we don't attack other countries. We are just we're here. We're good people. When you look at the history of the United States, um, it is not as a benevolent, kind, peaceful country. We do invade and occupy other countries. And this last decade has been stunning in what we have done to the world. And now that the world has, has economic powers that can rival the United States, political powers that can rival, we find ourselves during this economic crisis of the last week. I mean, wondering what would happen should China say, sorry, we aren't going to take any more of your debt. We're not buying up anymore. In fact, we're going to sell it off. And we're going to sell it at, you know, whatever rate. Um, we are in an, a very, very difficult predicament. The hole is very deep that we've been dug into for the last two years. But how do we get out of it? I mean, I, I think all of us, we, we don't want this to go on, this legacy to go on. We want to get out of it. In fact, most of you all in this room have been working hard over these last years to stop this, the hole getting deeper and deeper. We've been trying to fill the dirt back in so we can start climbing out of it. And those of you all who have been out on the streets and watching and walking and have been at your vigils, how many of you all vigil around on the street corners of Stanton or Charlottesville? I mean, it, it has been lonely at times, hasn't it? I mean, in the number of one-fingered salutes that you've been given over time, or people yelling, people yelling at you, or, but you know, it's less now, isn't it? You know, at least even the people who were the, saying, yeah, this war, we got to do it, you know, those guys, you know, well, we find all over the country that those types, those people are, are saying less and less and less. And when you put up that big sign that says, Honk for Peace, you get a lot, a lot of honks. And in fact, last weekend in Washington, D.C., on one of the intersections right near the White House, we had people on all four intersections that said, for, that were holding up signs, Honk to arrest Bush. And there were honks going on, honk, 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 honk. The Secret Service were coming out of their booth, what's going on here? All these cars are honking and honking. And David mentioned that on uh, yesterday morning uh, in Washington, D.C., on uh, Monday, let's see, what day is today? Wednesday? Tuesday. Tuesday. Yeah, Tuesday, that's right. Yeah, yesterday. Yesterday morning at 8 o'clock, there were about 10 of us. So, uh, ponchoed by Code Pink Women for Peace, a group of, uh, if you want to call some radicals, very uh, <laughs> women and a few guys who come in from all over the country who are there and watch to be a presence, to be a witness to what's going on there, to go into congressional hearings and be there in their bright pink outfits and their little tiaras and holding up pink signs to, uh, to tell the congressmen and women ask this question of that witness, or do this or do that, you know, and then all of a sudden there's a flare up and some one of them may stand up and say something and get hauled out, or, um, I mean, they, they're, they're women and men just like us, most of whom have never done anything like this in their whole lives. And yet in a period of two or three days of being in Washington and seeing what's going on there, all are so, I mean, they're outraged otherwise they wouldn't come to Washington, but then to be in the halls of Congress to say, to see that you can be from here to there to a congressman or a, a senator and that you can go up and you can, you can say, I'm Ann Wright from Honolulu, Hawaii, and Senator Akaka, I'd like to just talk to you about something. And Senator Akaka may not want to talk about what I want to talk about, like stopping the war or doing this or that. But once you've got, you know, they're good politicians. Once that hand goes out, they take it, they shake it, and then you don't turn loose. You <laughs> hang on and you grab hold and they want to keep they want to keep walking and you just hang on to it. And you walk and talk with them and you talk about whatever it is you it is. Well, on uh, Monday morning, we decided we were going to talk about this issue of uh, the welfare for the wealthy, for the billions for billionaires, to go to the U.S. Treasury where
King Henry, King Henry Paulson, head of the Treasury, Secretary of the Treasury, where his office was, and we would just be standing out there as the employees of the Treasury Department came to work. And we would be there with our bailout buckets. And we had little buckets that said, bailout, please give us money. We're trying to raise $700 billion before lunch because Henry needs that money to bail us out of this economic problem that we've had. And I happened to have a little mask that was about like this, and I was holding it up like that. And I had my bailout button and bucket, and I was saying, uh, well, the picture that was on it was of our president, George Bush, and I was saying, well, you know where the treasury is? It's located right next to the White House. And so I was, I'm George Bush, I'm the neighbor next door, and I'm trying to help King Henry get some more money for this bailout. Would you please, would you please give us some money, please some money, some money. And oh my goodness, some of the expressions that we had, um, some were kind of revulsion-like, pictures of this, you know, but most of them were, they kind of gave a little smile like, yeah, we know what you're talking about. You know, this is, this is, this is crazy stuff we're going through. That, that the Treasury is saying that we, the American public, have to raise 70, 700 billion dollars to bail out the corporate giants of our country who purposely, purposely lied and misrepresented what they were doing and inflated their their earning statements so that more and more money in and then where did it go? What happened to it? And yet they want us to pay $700 billion as a minimum to bail them, them out. So we were out there yesterday in a little bit of street theater just to remind people, you know, how are we going to get this? Are we going to do it bucket by bucket by bucket? Because we don't have any more money. We're so far in debt with the war in Iraq and all these other things. To add this onto it, it's crazy. We can't do it. And I was in the Congress this afternoon at 1 o'clock, just before I hopped in the car to drive here. <coughs> and I was in the latter part of the hearing where King Henry Paulson, Secretary of Treasury, and Ben Bernanke, the head of the Federal Reserve, were still testifying. They testified for five hours today before the Senate Banking Committee about their three-page plan, their, their very specific plan in some ways, like all powers held in the hands of the Secretary of Treasury, and he will designate how much we're going to pay off for what they call troubled assets. Now, in that a phrase, <laughs> troubled assets. Well, I'll tell you where my assets troubled, and it's not. And it's I'll tell you where it's not going to get bailed out by what they're planning for us right there. Fascinating to sit in these, and these are hearings that you can sit into too. Citizens are allowed to go in there. You can go and sit, and you can say something if you want to. Of course, you may not stay long in that hearing after you've said it. But I'll tell you, the congressmen and women and the senators do remember the fact that there are citizens in there, and that if a citizen feels so compelled that he or she stands up and says something, and they may be told to sit down, or they may be told, that's enough, go on out, or they may be told, you're arrested now, and here come the cops, and out you go. But they remember you when they see you in the hallway the next day. And most of them will say, thank you for being there. Thank you. We need the public there. We need citizens to be there. And like tonight, right now, fellow citizens, five members of Veterans for Peace, and I wore my Veterans for Peace t-shirt in honor of them. Um, had I not been coming here tonight, I would probably with, be with them up on the upper reaches of the, of the landings of the uh, archives, the National Archives on Constitution Avenue. This morning at 7 o'clock, five of them scaled the fence and went over onto this ledge, and they are staying there for a minimum of 24 hours on a fast, and this big, huge 20-foot sign that says, arrest Bush and Cheney for war crimes being hung up there on the pillars of the, of the U.S. archives, the National Archives. And they're standing up there. They are up there with, with tapes that they're playing to the people who are going into the archives all day long to look at the Constitution, to look at the Bill of Rights, to look at all of those major documents that are the foundation of what we believe our country stands for. And they are standing there knowing full well that they will be arrested, 
And at any time, the police can scale the uh, fence and go over and pull them out of there. But as one of the police officers said about uh, 10 o'clock this morning, you know, it took an hour for the police to actually get there to even find out they were there. It was the darndest thing in the world. You know, we think we have, you know, Homeland Security is protecting everything. Well, yeah. they missed those five vets that were that had climbed over a fence into the National Archives patio and had raised this 20-foot banner between two of the giant pillars. They missed that one. Well, when the police finally got there and the police captain was uh, kind of looking this thing over and. Uh, he said, um, you know, I don't care if they stay up there 30 days. That's fine with me. Uh, because what are they going to do? How's it going to look when uh, the police come up there to eject veterans? It's my age, Diane Wilson from Seagriff, Texas, a, sh a shrimper, an environmentalist, a woman who is the salt of the earth from South Texas. She joined the military back in the Vietnam War. She was a, a medic. And she, her first job was at Fort Sam Houston, Texas, in the hospital there. And she started talking to all these guys coming back to Vietnam. And they were in the hospital, the burn units there, and uh, they were telling her the stories of Vietnam. And she thought, I don't want to be a part of this. What these guys have gone through, they have done. Look at what they are, uh, the mental problems they have. And then she married. Well, she decided she would not uh, continue with that career that time in the military. So she became a war resistor. Diane Wilson, just in 1968, just left Fort Sam Houston, got on a bus, and went to Toronto, Canada. And she stayed up there for two months. And then she ran out of money. Her parents sent her some money. She got back on the bus and came back down to Fort Sam Houston, turned herself in, and um, got a dishonorable discharge from the military. And for the last 40 years, she has not said a word about it until Camp Casey in Crawford, Texas. And here were all these veterans that were at Camp Casey in support of, of Cindy Sheehan, whose son had been killed in, in Iraq, and who, Cindy, who, who was at a Veterans for Peace conference in Dallas, the National Conference for Veterans for Peace. And she said to the group this Friday afternoon, she said, you know, Crawford, Texas is only two hours from Dallas. Why don't we, why don't we drive down there? Let's, let's confront the President of the United States about this war. So a hundred of us hopped in the cars, and off we went. And that Saturday, we, we were in Crawford and drove out to those checkpoints. And from that Saturday, for the next 26 days, we stayed in those ditches of Crawford, Texas. And over 15,000 people came, to include Diane Wilson, who heard that this mom was out there. And it was there that Diane started talking to fellow veterans, because she had been around veterans. She had gone home, and that was the end of her military career. And when we heard what she had done, when she finally started talking to us, well, I was in the military, I was in during Vietnam, and I got a... I didn't like it very well. well nobody else did either. Well, I went to Canada. You went to Canada? Yeah, I did. And we had other other guys who had gone to Canada who had, who were actually at that uh, at Camp Casey, and they came over. And you know the support that she got out of that 40 years after she'd done that. And so now she's sitting right up there at the National Archives, along with four other people that are saying to the President of the United States and the Vice President of the United States, you must be arrested because you have violated our Constitution and that we are going to get you tried on war crimes. So I'm proud of those five people, and I hope you all are too. <laughs> well, the stories that we can tell you about men and women just like you all, who are taking time out of their lives, as you are doing here in Stanton and in Charlottesville, you're doing great you know, how you're counting out these wars. Thank you for trying to, and succeeding in preventing a war with Iran. You know, that's it. if it had been so far, if it had been for public heat on our administration, I think we would have seen something much different at this point. So thank you for all that you're doing and know that you're doing the right thing because it, we have a great country. It is a, a fine country. We've just gone down a bad, bad path right now that we need to get off of and make sure that we are on a, an extremely good path that we can be proud of and the rest of the world can be proud with us. Thank you. Thank you.